Getting a little recording. All right, fantastic. We're recording. So again, thank you everybody for joining. I'm going to share my screen so that we can get this going here. All right, everybody. Like I said, my name is Kurt Davis with Real Estate Wealth Coaching. Jack Simon, my partner, is on the stream tonight as well. But we're gonna get. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get through a few of these sides here very quickly so that we can really get to the main meeting. Uh, if you do not follow us already, make sure that you follow us on Facebook at Real Estate Wealth Coaching. Same thing at Instagram and on Meetup Real Estate Wealth Coaching. I just actually figured out how to change the name because it used to be Memphis Real Estate Investors Meetup, but I felt Real Estate Wealth Coaching was a little more uh, appropriate. So just make sure that you're following us on any one of these sources because this is where we put out new meetings that are coming out. We put out a lot of great information. So connect with us, follow us here. Also, if, you, if anybody likes watching YouTube videos, uh, check us out on YouTube. We're putting a ton of great content out. A lot of, lot of tips, strategies, techniques, a lot of the stuff that we teach students through our program. I also have a ton of great interviews from local real estate investors that a lot of you probably already know. Guys like Michael Hayes, Rich Harrell, Stephen Eck and Donna, uh, things like that. And I also have some videos on there of, of myself doing some actual flips. So check it out. We really appreciate it. And if you do go to YouTube, make sure you click the subscribe button. Uh, we're trying to grow our content. Obviously I have this picture on here. It says we have 903 subscribers. Uh, we're actually close to about 1800 now. So uh, 1800 subscribers within the last few weeks. All right. All right. Avalon capital for a lot of investors out there who are trying to get into flipping properties. One of the things that you're going to need is private lending. Uh, Avalon Capital is a private lending entity here in Memphis that makes asset-based loans only. So they're not pulling credit, uh, things like that. The terms are very simple, straightforward. I put it right out here for you to see. They charge five points loan origination, 1% a month interest only. They're usually a six month term. If your term goes longer, there's a two point renewal fee. Uh, there's no prepayment penalties and loan terms are roughly 70 to 80% loan to value. So should you find a good enough deal uh, with purchase and rehab, a lot of times you could, you could technically do a zero down deal. Uh, th they will make loans to you, whether you're wanting to do fix and flip or whether you're wanting to do the burr strategy and build a portfolio of properties, uh, it doesn't matter. Now, if you see the link down there at the bottom, realestatewealthcoaching.com backslash private lending, I would encourage you to go there and fill out the very, very simple um, application. Even if you don't have a property that you're doing right now, go ahead and fill it out just because we'll have your information in the database so that when you do have a property and you're ready for a loan, we can get your file going that much quicker and we can do this really fast. So uh, it's very easy and flexible and we do a lot of loans for a lot of local investors. So just fill out the lending application and we'll have you on file. All right, let's see here. Okay. For anybody who's wholesaling out there, we are buying houses. We buy all over the city. Of course, we pay cash and close fast. Uh, I put down a lot of the zip codes that I have down there. You know, maybe pull out your phone, take a photo. We really buy all over the city. There's really just a handful of areas that we typically try to stay out of, but we're in North Mississippi. Uh, we'll, we will buy houses that are maybe the only strategy is retail. Uh, we will certainly do that. But like everybody else, we need properties. Uh, I put Angelo Anderson's contact information there. He is the gentleman in our office who is our acquisitions manager. So, I mean, you can also send the properties to me too, but if you send them to me, I'm going to forward it on to him so he can, he can work any leads that you have. But please send us anything that you have. Uh, we are just trying to, trying to get as many homes as we can so that we can sell to our clients. All right. So... The next meeting, and, and, and I don't know what's going to happen uh, in terms of how the quarantine is working, when they're planning on saying to the public that we can actually meet in person again. Um, so what my plan is, is that Thursday, April 30th, same time, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Central, if we're not going to meet in person, we will do it again uh, using live stream through Zoom. And 
what I was going to do is do a panel and I was going to bring three gentlemen on. I was going to bring Stephen Eckendana, Rich Harrell, and Anthony Frank. All three of these are local investors who have all been in real estate. Now, Stephen Eckendana has been in, been in real estate longer than all of these gentlemen. He's been in for about six years. Rich Harrell has been doing this for a handful and uh, same thing for Anthony, but they all kind of focus a little bit on different strategies of what they're doing in their own business and they're doing it. And what I wanted to do is just bring them on, whether we're going to do it in person or I'll figure out a way how we do this uh, through, uh, through live stream. But it's, it's basically going to be an open panel discussion talking about how, you know, who they were before real estate, how they got started, what are they doing in their business? Uh, why are they successful? What motivates them? That kind of stuff. So I will be sending out information about the meeting. And, and of course I'll have to confirm with these guys and make sure that they're still available. They did commit to me that, uh, we would do this. So again, just stay tuned and we will bring more information. So uh, I think it's going to be an incredible meeting if I can put it together. So I hope you all think so as well. All right, Jack, if you would not mind, I'm going to um, unmute you here. And uh, if you would not mind taking over on this one. All right. Uh, so what Jack's going to do is he's going to talk to you a little bit about what our program is. Hey everybody. So what we've created is actually a program and we've created a system that actually takes you through the process, depending on where you are in your real estate journey and actually takes you uh, from, if you're a wholesaler, how to get your first deal, how to find properties off market, how to negotiate and how to close. If you are already wholesaling and you would like to actually get into the uh, fix and flip process and you will learn how to actually uh, take that money put it into the property and then list it or flip it to a private investor for a bigger spread. Or if you want to actually build your portfolio, we've created a system to allow people to do that and teach people. So uh, what we've got right now for you, for the free gift for everybody that's tuned in right now, if you go to realestatewealthcoaching.com, you can sign up for our free training. And if you go to that link right there, you'll actually learn a lot more about the program. But for everyone that's tuned in, Make sure you write down realestatewealthcoaching.com. As soon as this is over, go there and sign up for the free gifts. Uh, you're going to receive four-part free training series that's actually incredibly valuable, probably at least a $500 value. And from there, you'll actually learn some more information about the program. You'll have the opportunity to apply. So we'd love to have you involved. And um, just go to realestatewealthcoaching.com after this for those free gifts. All right, Jack, I really appreciate uh, you given the pitch for the program. Like I said, we've, you know, we've got a lot of great uh, opportunities out there for investors, whether you're wanting to wholesale, fix and flip or buy and hold, but this is where everybody starts. And this is the progression on where we see people heading uh, in their real estate journey. So uh, Dan Butler, we are going to bring Dan onto the meeting here. Now, <laughs> Dan Butler is one of the co-founders of Crestcore Realty. And Dan is, uh, hopefully he's got his presentation up here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm gonna let Dan take over so that he can start his presentation. I'm stopping the share. Dan, you are up, my man. All right, let's see, share screen. And there we go, buddy. I'm going to, I'm going to bow out and I'm gonna let you handle it. All right. So bear with me. Cause this is my first one doing a zoom presentation. So, uh, there's always and, a and also just real, real quick. If you have huh? questions, go ahead and do it through the chat and I'll, and I'll be doing my best to monitor this. If I, I'll, I'll try and do my best to stay up with the chat for everybody who's out there. So I'll only try to chime in Dan, if there's a question that somebody has and I'll, I'll just jump in. All right. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Just let right. me know. That'd be, right, that'd buddy. be great. You're up. So not, not a big fan of talking about it my, myself, but I love telling about the journey. Just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So, you know, from, from my perspective, I started in real estate in 2001. Uh, my journey actually started before then uh, in high school. Uh, it was actually uh, a mentor of mine. I was actually the grunt guy doing yard work or helping board up houses or doing knickknack stuff. And he taught me about wealth creation and so in the back of my mind, before I went to college and did engineering, I knew I wanted to do real estate. I had just had no idea what that looked like. So moved here in 1998, 
uh, manufacturing, 2001, bought my first multifamily up in Raleigh Frazier, up on New Allen, if anybody knows where that is, 19 units. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, um, you know, for two, I worked two jobs for 13 years, basically just manufacturing operations. I was traveling the whole U S you know, some years, 90% of the time, some years, 50% of the time, which was a blessing and a curse, you know, it was hard, but, um, you know, um, it allowed me time. Like, you know, I was by myself. So hotels, you know, I could uh, do calls at night in the morning, lunch breaks, those kind of things to, to make offers on houses and, you know, do contractors and leasing and all that stuff. So that's before management companies and all that stuff. So I just, I was on my own and just kind of did that for, uh, for many, many years. And with that, I was just a buy and hold investor. I was doing Burr before Burr was a you know, famous acronym. Um, and what I really want to tell you about that is just the singular focus. Um, you know, I didn't, uh, all I did was I had a line of credit off my townhouse in Midtown, buy a property, work, work on it, get it rented, refinance it and buy in the next one. And so I just kept leapfrogging over and over again. So, <clears throat> you know, what I see a lot of people, and that's where I, 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 you know, hopefully kind of resonate through this presentation is just getting a singular focus and not trying to be all things to all people and chasing the shiny objects. And, um, and I'm still bad about that to this day. I still have to hone myself in, but, um, you know, that singular focus, the more you get focused on one thing, the better you'll be long-term. And then when you get good at it, you know, add on another layer, um, you know, did that for several years, started running with my business partner in 2004. We actually moved in the same neighborhood. Uh, did our first to get, deal together in 2007. And, you know, kind of had this mantra, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's just, that's not just for us, but that's also for other partnerships that we have. Um, we spent six months just working on core values. Um, as you're working on your business, you know, really figure out who you are and who you want to partner with. And, really let that define you and, and who, you know, you partner with work with and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, if you stay true to who your core values are, you'll be more successful long-term uh, and, and, and go farther uh, faster. You know, and then the other thing is just figuring out your strengths and weaknesses. That's one thing that part of this journey. And I, again, this is leading up to multifamily, but just um, figuring out what you're good at, what you're not good at, focus on your strengths, outsource your weaknesses. Um, and, you know, kind of funny thing, my, my business partner, and I, we still run four days a week. We ran this morning, uh, we ran Tuesday in the rain every, 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 other, every other day, 6 a.m. So those are our strategy meetings, those are business meetings, uh, just catch up meetings. And then really, we don't really talk during the week. You know, he's off doing his thing, I'm doing my thing and, and focusing on the business. And then, you know, part of my journey, market crash 2008 uh, was the real growth. A lot of people were losing houses due to, you know, over leveraging, not buying them right, uh, taking too much money out. And the banks were calling us, you know, left and right, you know, offering us deals to take things uh, off their hands. So that was, uh, that was kind of a defining moment for us. You know, I've been doing it from 01 to 07, um, just kind of methodically trucking along. And then 08 is just like this, this, this burst. And I feel like this, you know, this virus deal, who knows what it's going to, how long it's going to last, what it's going to look like. But, you know, I do think there's going to be some opportunities coming out of that. So be thinking that way, you know, as you move forward in the coming weeks and months, you know, and I, I don't wish, uh, you know, uh, bad things to happen to anybody. Um, and hopefully we'll all make it through it, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, you know, cash flow and all that good stuff and not having to, to worry about those kind of things, but there are going to be some casualties, unfortunately. And I think there are, are going to be some opportunities to come out of that for, for those that are pre prepared and wanting to do something. Um, we started managing for others in 2010. So you see from 2001 to 2010, all I did was burr strategy and all we did was burr strategy. Uh, we started Crestcore officially in 2012. We hired our first employee in 2013. Um, and, and the reason that's important is we just did a six month experiment. We just said, you know, we're going to, we're going to put $18,000 of, of, of our money um, to work hiring somebody. And let's see what happens. And, and what happened was we doubled the first year. And that's where I really learned the power of leverage, whether it be your leverage of employees, vendors, banks, agents, you know, it's got to be a win-win, but there's, you know, when you leverage others and leverage you know, people that you deal with, uh, that's when you really can exponentially grow whatever you're trying to work on. 
Uh, started investment brokerage 2013, mainly for family and friends, but that's expanded to mostly out of state. Started a maintenance company in 15, lending business 18, expanded to Jackson, Tennessee in 2018. Started a virtual staffing company in 2019, and then we went to Dyersburg in 2019. So if you can see the kind of thing when I look at that is just so much singular focus for so many years. And then when you really get good at something, you start layering in. And that's kind of the lesson I just want to show in my background of, of what we've done is just uh, being methodical and, 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 and pulling things in as, as opportunities as you get good at, um, you know, the things you started on. So multifamily versus single family. This is where y'all, you know, chimed in to um, kind of talk through sold on cap rates. You know, so that was one thing I learned early on is that, uh, you know, houses versus duplexes, ver you know, versus multifamily, they really are sold on cap rates. You know, they really, you know, they generally require more money down. Um, you know, it, there's a lot more complicated variables that you got to think about. You know, there's, there's a house is just, you, you, you rent it, it goes vacant, you fix it up, you have the power on a couple months, cut the yard a couple months and move on and get it rented and, and, and that's it. For multifamily, you gotta think about all kinds of things. You gotta think about the utilities, water, gas, electric. Most apartments are gonna have just a, a main meter going into that apartment that's you know, split off to whether it's 10 units or 20 units. And I can guarantee you those tenants are not gonna call you, the residents, they're not gonna call you when that water is dripping because it's not their money. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the key variables that you have to look at dumpsters, uh, picking up the trash around the complex. You got, and it's not so much the residents, it's, it's the, the, you know, the, the friends of the residents. That's why I always, I was up in my apartment that very first one I talked about in 2001, I was there Friday for an appraisal and there was people everywhere and half the people didn't even live there. So you got to worry about that and what they do to your, your complex, uh, lawn care, cars, uh, neighbors, you know, like, you know, when you have multifamily versus single family, single family, even if they're loud music or drugs or whatever it is they might be doing, it's kind of contained to that one unit. When you have a multifamily, it's just exponential. So you got to think about, um, you know, like I said in here, one tenant can take you out. So if you have one tenant that's just loud, I mean, I had this on my apartment in Monroe, you know, one tenant uh, just smoking, you know, smoking stuff and loud music. And next thing you know, the, the neighbors beside and across and, and on either side of them want to move out. And so because that one tenant, now you got four vacancies if you don't act quick. Um, you know, and then everything is magnified, um, you know, with apartments, you know, instead of one house or one issue, say roaches, just give example, or bed bugs, that, that's probably one of, the, one of the worst I've had that stuff moves and just multiplies and goes to all these units. And next thing you know, instead of doing a, you know, hundred dollar call for roaches or bed bugs, you're doing a $600 call all for one, you know, one issue. Um, same thing, electrical issues. Like uh, you buy an apartment and it's got aluminum wiring. You know, if you buy 20 unit, that insurance company might make you do all 20, uh, which is not a fun you know, thing at a thousand dollars a pop. So, just keep that in mind when you're looking at multifamily, everything is magnified. It's just not, you know, single, single family house. You can kind of, is it a $5,000 rehab, a $10,000 or 20,000? Uh, multifamily is going to be, oh, is it 10,000 times 20 units? So just keep that in mind as you're, you know, looking at multifamily. You know, more complicated barriers, the tenant base. You know, one thing I've really seen uh, over the years is it's the concept of staying somewhere versus living somewhere. And what that means is, you know, in multifamily environments, the, the, that they're, they're more transient, um, which leads to your vacancy rate. So if you see an apartment building that's a C-class apartment, they tell you it's 5% vacant, I will call, you know, BS on that. I mean, like that's, that's just not, you know, not feasible over the life of a year uh, because tenants are constantly moving through in multifamily. So keep that in mind, liability, much higher. Uh, multifamily versus uh, single family. And you can imagine, like, so I had one fire in one unit uh, back last year uh, uh, on my apartments in uh, Raleigh Frazier, and it took out seven units and it took me 11 months to get it back. You know, so the liability, anything that happens out there um, or any apartment, uh, it's just much more, much more liability. So be, you know, be cautious of that with your insurance, 
how you're looking at security, cameras, fencing, um, even security guards, that kind of stuff. And then you go into insurance, you know, and property taxes. Those are both commercial rates. So we have like uh, master policies for a single family. And then we have a separate policy just for uh, the, the apartments. And same thing with property, property taxes. If you go to the Shelby County Assessor and click those buttons and calculate taxes, um, there's definitely a different rate uh, for commercial versus single family. So you got to really understand that um, and what's that, what that means. And so, you know, when we talk about insurance requirements as part of that, the, um, you know, houses, you know, a lot of times you fi find insurance for 300, 400, 500, whatever it is. And they never, they never even go to your house. They just, you know, you submit the information at three, two in Cordova or whatever, and you pay your $600 of, you know, a year and you're done, you know, multifamily, they're going to, they're going to send an inspector out there. Uh, aluminum wiring. That's huge. Um, the first apartment I bought, the second part, apartment bought 16 unit had aluminum wiring going from the meter to the breaker box inside. And that's, you know, it was like 1200 bucks a piece. And that wasn't something I planned when I bought that, but insurance came in and just uh, kind of kicked me back for a year just to, to take care of that issue. But long-term it's better because of the, the, the hazards. Uh, you got trip hazards, fire extinguisher, smoke detectors. I mean, if you don't have those in the hallway, you know, um, that's a big deal. Security could be a big deal. So, insurance can really drive number one it's expensive and number two they might require you to do something that on the front end you might not assume so the more you can talk to your insurance agent up front and maybe even have them visit the property or or whatever ask questions or see their questionnaire what they're going to ask or what they're going to look for um, the better so just kind of good do that on the front end um, you know advantages advantages to multifamily you can scale faster. You know, that's why I started with it. I mean, I had a 19 unit and a 16 unit the first two years. Um, so I had, you know, I guess that would have been over a million dollars worth of real estate in my first two years of uh, getting in the business. The same thing, equity pay down, you know, you're paying down because you got such a big asset uh, and you put it on a 15 or 20, say a 15 year note. Um, that was, you know, back in the day um, I'd work all month and I'd be like, man, I don't have any cash left after, you know, all the bills are paid and vacancies and turnover. But then you look at your bank statement and you're like, Oh wow, I paid $3,000 down to this apartment this month. And it's stuff like that that will keep you going. Um, you know, advantages units, you know, if, if you're trying to build units and that's what your one of your goals, long-term cash flow. So when you pay those things off, um, you know, you got one asset, one location, 16, 20, 30, 40 units. I mean, you know, that's, that, that's a tremendous cash flow versus having say 40 different houses and, and just go to one location to manage. Um, it creates consistency. You know, you can do same parts like, um, and I think you'll do this as you grow a portfolio of houses, but a multifamily really gets you honed in on figuring that out. Same water heaters, same faucets, same flooring, um, same doors, those kind of things. So, the more you can do that, the better it is for your long-term repair cost, uh, long-term cost, because then you can start saying, well, I'm using, you know, X amount of faucets a year or X amount of doors, or I'm buying this much tile. So then you can plan for it and, and buy it when you see it in bulk. So those, those kind of things pop up when, um, um, when you have something like a multifamily to, to do. Syndication, you know, like, well, that's one of the advantages I see with a lot of investors out there. You know, they can raise capital, they can get their family and friends, um, they can spread the risk. So, and if for those that have never heard that term or, or kind of like wonder, wonder what that is, it's basically you're, you're creating an LLC and say there's 20 of us and we own, we all own 5% of that LLC, for example. And so we all put in, say it's a million dollar property, 20% down, that's 200,000 and you got 20 partners, what is that, uh, 10,000 a piece? And we all own a, a portion of that property. So um, that, is a, that is an advantage. So then you can scale quicker. We, I know one, uh, one group of guys that have invested in Memphis that have bought probably a thousand units and there's probably 10 different partners. So they own 10% of a thousand units. And so the risk is spread over 10 complexes 
Um, and that's, that's big, right? So you're not stuck on one property. Say, you know, you had hundred units, all the one facility. Now you got a thousand over 10. So there's a way to spread that risk, you know, going into how to find them. Um, you know, for us as kind of, you know, that beginner middle investor, you know, I always tell people to kind of focus on 40, four to 50 units, uh, because you can manage remotely. You can, um, uh, hire an on-site manager that, you know, maybe lives for free or, you know, reduced rent, something like that. Um, and it kind of flies under the radar, but private equity is not looking at those. They're looking kind of the A-class or hundred unit, you know, apartment complexes that are kind of self-contained. You know, the one thing I've seen is LoopNet, you know, it's too late. Um, when you see it on LoopNet, you know, it's, it, the deals have gone by and those are kind of like, if, if you look on there, it's just, it's just too late. MLS, you know, there are some deals on there, but normally it's C-class or lower or some value add. I would focus on the wholesalers. I'd be calling property management companies that uh, manage these kind of properties. You know, we do, Renshaw, uh, JD Mark, Reedy. There's several of us in town that do this kind of size property. Maybe just touch a base with them uh, and see what they know. Uh, same thing with real estate agents. One thing I used to do, and I don't do it as much as I used to anymore, but uh, if I see a red and white sign, like the for rent sign or the white and black sign uh, at a house or, or apartment, man, call that number and just see what's going on. You know, sometimes, a lot of times that's an indication of, um, I don't want to use the word old, a wise investor. <laughs> you know, somebody has been around for a while. And so if you catch them at the right time, they might just sell, um, you know, and if you see a property you like, go talk to the tenants. You know, um, I was at the apartment on last Friday and like half of them still know me and still you know, talking to me and, you know, they probably can connect you with that owner one way or another. So if you're interested in that property and just go talk to the tenants and just see, especially on the smaller ones, the, the bigger ones is going to tell you, just go, go to speak to the office, but the smaller ones are probably going to know, uh, where to, where to, um, send you. So Kurt, any questions so far? Are you good? Okay. Financing. Here's, you know, if there's one slide that I can tell you guys, whether it's the single family, multifamily, local banks are key. Um, you know, that's one thing. I don't know how or why I learned this, but uh, I stayed away from the Bank of America, the Wells Fargo, the regions. I didn't even walk in their doors. I, I just, I think maybe I read something. I can't remember, but I established about four or five different banking relationships with local banks. Like if you go down Poplar Corridor, start at say Highland and go down to Germantown, you look at left, look at right and look at all those banks in South and um, uh, uh, trying to think Triumph and uh, Community Bank and Brighton Bank and you know, just all those different banks try to, you know, uh, you know, establish relationships, you know, start it now, even if you're not, you know, whether it's single family or multifamily, this kind of replies to both on some of this, but, you know, go to those local banks and just go meet some people. And so you're going to find some of those love small, small commercial. And you're going to find that, you know, every bank has a preference. You know, one thing that it took me several years to understand this, but every bank is built by a board. Um, and that board has different flavors. Does that make sense? I'm saying it might be like in, you know, in Mississippi, we have, I love Mississippi banks. That's one of my favorites, but um, those guys are a lot of times are a bunch of farmers, you know, from the Delta. Um, and so sometimes they don't understand real property and sometimes they don't get it unless they did it themselves. You might have uh, a bank that was started by a bunch of manufacturing guys that just don't get real estate, but love commercial. I mean, there's, so just, get to know your per, uh, commercial lender and then ask him for help to understand the, the, the bank, the board that's going to be behind them to understand it. Like, do I even have a chance to do this deal? I, I literally talked to a guy today on the way home, one of our clients, one of our best clients we have in property management um, that I hooked him up with. And uh, it was evident that the bank, the bank was offered him a deal, but with the interest and terms they gave him, they were basically saying, yes, thanks. But, you know, we'll do it, but if you'll, you know, you got to do these, you know, harder terms, you know what I mean? It's like, for example, it was like five, uh, five, three, five percent right now. I mean, the interest rate is what prime is like three. What is it? 
two and a half. I don't know. I don't know. Some, something like that. So it should be more like five, four and a half, four, something like that. So just, just find that bank is what I'm saying. Anyway, on the financing also, they're going to be 75 to 80% loan to, loan to value. So early on for me, that's why it knocked me out. You know, I, I got, I found a few um, deals that I was able to finance through owner financing or partial owner financing or just right place at the wrong time. But, you know, I would say focus on the deals where the owner will take a second. That's just one of my big advice. So I took the nine apartments that we own either by myself or collectively with my partner and seven out of nine have some sort of owner financing. Dan. Yes. Well, I want to jump in one thing real quick and yeah. I wanted to say this, it, it, it kind of correlates with where you're talking about the loan to values and financing. Uh, one thing that people just kind of need to know with commercial and multifamily is where when you're, when you're buying single family rental properties from like a, like a traditional method, you cannot, borrow money from somebody to use as your down payment. But in commercial and especially with small multifamily, if the bank requires 25% down, that individual could find a private lender to give them the 25% down as like a private loan. Uh, and so in theory, from that standpoint, you could technically do 100% financing, 75% from the bank and 25% from the private lender, but the big issue that you'll find is that a lot of private lenders will not want to be in a second position uh, on the loan. Do you find that uh, to be correct? You know, it's funny. Um, I think that, um, you know, I was talking to a guy up north yesterday and he, he had always counted himself out on owner financing because he thought, that he should be asking for 80%. Um, and I'm saying, I'm saying, no, you flip that and just try to get 10, 20%. You know, if, if you get somebody that owns say a half a million dollar piece of property, they've owned it for years and you say, I can get you 400,000 a day. You take a hundred thousand uh, second, you know, there's all kinds of advantages of that. So from, you know, tax advantages, cause they're not paying all the, capital gains. It gives them a little nest egg of payments per month. I mean, there's, you know, the, the, the big key to that is just saying, um, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, give them choices. That was, that would be my one key, Kurt, is just, just give them choices. Like if you're making an offer on a multifamily, I would not go in with one offer. I would go in with at least two, if not three, you know, an all cash, um, you know, whether you, you know, whether you got it to truly to back it up or not, something like an 80, 20 and something like all owner finance. And so basically you put the power, you know, you're fine with every, every, you know, I say that on that first one, you probably should have the ability to get it financed, but you go in with three deals and you should, you know, you basically put the power back into the seller's hands. So now they like, Oh wow. Okay. I got these three choices and they get to choose. And, the way you set that up, you got to be fine with, you know, if you set it up right, you should be fine with either all three of the choices. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and, you know, part of that, that three choices is just a phrase that I taught, I got taught a long time ago that I still keep to this day is your price, my terms, your terms, my price. You can't have both. We can't have both and they can't have both, meaning the seller. So I'll give you, you know, the, uh, what is the guy's name at uh, MIG, um, whose brother has the HVAC, Kurt, you know? Um, Scarborough. 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 He bought a house 30 years ago that was 50,000. I, I don't remember the number. You probably know the story better than I do, but probably 50,000 more what he wanted to pay, gave full price offer, 0% financing. So that seller was stuck on getting say 275 and he just gave them 275 at 0%. So what did that mean? That meant that every payment over the, you know, 15 years, 180 payments, every payment went to principal. So why wouldn't you be okay with that payment plan? So anyway, price terms, terms, price. Um, 
most, just keep this in mind, most banks will require professional management when you're talking about multifamily. They, they got so burned back in 2008 to 12 with people just abandoning properties that that's become kind of the norm. Um, they might specify who, they might specify just that you, um, uh, that they got to sign off on who your, prof, you know, your professional property management is. Look at 15 year note versus 20. I, you know, looking back at it now, you know, I did a ton of 15 year, 10 year, five year. We did a bunch of those kind. I might, would look at 20 plus, um, you know, and I, I put here as a note, if you have a W2 or no W2, that's going to affect your approach early on for me. Um, I had a W2 as we talked about manufacturing. So I was doing 15 year notes for everything because I did not want, you know, I did not need that cash flow. I wanted everything to hit principal as fast and hard as I could. Um, but you know, if you can do 20 and you feel good about it and you know, you don't need the money or, you know, that you feel like you could put it back towards the principal at some point, then I would do that. Um, you know, then we talked about, Kurt and I were talking about this the other day. You got money partners that can help you with this. Don't just think you're out there. Well, I don't have any money. How do I buy a multi money, uh, a multifamily, uh, a, a complex. You can do hard money. Uh, you can do somebody that's a true partner. Yeah. I've seen somebody that's, you know, all the money, say $500, $500,000 complex and they provide all the money, but they're 50, 50 partners. And guess what? You're a sweat equity. Well, that sure is better than where you started at zero. So don't get hung up on, well, he's not doing anything or, you know, like, no, he earned some money to be able to put into your deal. So he earned the right to have sweat equity uh, or excuse me, equity versus the sweat equity. So uh, the whole goal would be some point you switch that to where you're the actual equity and then helping somebody else with the sweat equity. So, so what you could do in that situation yeah. there is if someone has very little or no money, but they find a money partner uh, and they form an LLC together and they mm -hmm. purchase that multifamily unit, you could have some type of arrangement and plan where, you know, obviously you're using the money partner, but you put some term in place where say within the next three to five years, the goal is to refinance out so that you're the only owner. And then you pay off your, call it your money partner, who's your 50, 50 partner with some type of pre predetermined profit. Have you ever done anything like that, Dan, or have you heard of anybody doing anything like that? Say that last part again. Okay, so if you and I are going to buy a multifamily unit, yeah. I don't have any money, but you have the money for the down payment. You and I form the LLC together and we go to the bank. Great, we get the financing, but ultimately I want to own this apartment myself <clears throat> after some period of time. So yeah. we have some sort of written agreement that states that sometime within say the next five years, I will refinance and pay you off with some type of added interest that makes it worth your while. While you even, even while at the same time, 50, 50 owners, you're still partaking in cash flow and that kind of stuff. Have you ever heard of anybody doing that? Yeah, a few, but not many. I mean, unfortunately, I think that's, uh, I think either people want to be in the deal or just loan on the deal. So I don't sure. see many that kind of want, so, you know, a little bit of both. I mean, it, it gets a little bit complicated, but that only sounds like something that you'd get like your relative to do for you. I was about to say, yeah, like a mom or a grandpa or yeah. you know, something like that. So I don't, you know, somebody that just has money at, at a CD for 2% or something like that. That's, you know, that's just want to try to help you. That's where I would see that probably sure. play out. Uh, all right. Analyzing deals. What data do you need? I mean, you need a rent roll. You need as far back as you can go. Uh, we had a client this, uh, this week that was trying to sell and his, his bank, the bank of the buyer wanted three years of rent roll. Um, so I, I would just encourage if you do look at a multifamily, just go as far back as you can go get leases. Um, we're actually taking over management of apartment today, uh, 24 unit. And I was a guy in California. I was like, so what does the leases say? Cause he's worried about evictions. I was like, what does this lease say about assignment of the lease? And he's like, they're all a month to month. And I was like, well, that's a red flag, you know, like, so what, what, what's going on there that, that, that's not managed to the point where you're really buttoned up and having leases, you know, on that property, get the maintenance records. I mean, the one thing that really has always driven me crazy in this, in, in Memphis specifically, and I know it's, you know, all throughout the U S and probably the world, but 
you know, those performers, you see like people that put on an apartment that, well, here's what it can do. And it's like, no, no. What is it doing? You know, like, what is it doing right now? That's what you're trying to figure out. So, you know, you don't bet on the come, if you will, you're, you're buying it where it sits right now, not for what it can be. So if you're sell, if you're buying something that's in there showing a performer, that's going to show you a hundred thousand dollars income net, but, you look at the actual, you know, P and L's or W twos or whatever it is that they can provide. And it's 20,000. Where's the 80, where's the 80 coming from? Hope and a prayer. You know what I mean? Like that's just, that doesn't work. Um, so buy it on the actuals that are happening. Don't buy it on performers. That's just, that's just, that's just not, that's not good, not good, not good business. Um, look at the utility bills and all the other expenses. I mean, does it have trash? The utility bills like that, that utility bill could be huge, you know, with uh, the common area utilities and how much water and is there a laundry room, all that kind of stuff. Um, list of upgrades, really important to understand, like if you got 20 units and 20 of them have brand new furnaces and AC units. Oh, wow. So I can probably peter out, you know, for the next 10 years, I'm gonna have one or two units a year and you build that into your model. Um, and then you, under, you need to understand what your bank's willing to do. Now, probably, Kurt, I probably should have put that first. I would say, understand what your bank's willing to do before you even go in to look at any deal. Are they willing to do 15, 20, 25? Are they willing to do, what's the interest rate right now? Is it 4%, 5%? Uh, how much do they want down? So all that needs to be plugged in on the front end. And I would have a bank ready to go to say, I'm willing to do this. It's, a, it's very similar with the whole birth strategy. You know, a private lender is not going to want to make you a loan if they don't know that you're pre-approved on the back end for the refinance with the lender. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. Make sure you know exactly what the lender, uh, what their options and what they'll allow before you go into it, because that, you know, maybe, maybe they have some type of term that you never thought about that makes it even more flexible for you in your negotiation with the seller. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, any issues now, you know, are present or now at scale. So, we talked about aluminum wiring or the driveways. I've seen driveways that, uh, Dan, real could, quick. Yeah. All right. Lance wants to know, how do you get the bank ready to go? If they have no deal to underwrite, do you need to get the, get the multifamily unit under contract first? I would say no. I mean, I, and I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this Lance, but I would say, you know, I would start with local banks understanding. Do you like number one? What, who are you and what are you trying to do? And then find that bank that says, okay, we align on what you're trying to do. And then I would throw my deposits and anything I could think of, you know, your checking account and all that stuff to show that you're, Hey man, I'm in for your bank. I, I believe in your mission and where you're trying to go. And it looks like we're going to be good partners. And then I would just focus on trying to get some sort of pre-approval, you know, like, you know, are, can, can they help you get a 20, $250,000 apartment? Can they help you get a half a million dollar apartment? You know, um, what, what is it they're willing to do? You got to know that on the front end because you don't want to put something under contract, waste your time, waste the seller's time, potentially lose your deposit while you're trying to figure all that out. Like it's just super stressful. I've always just tried to say, here's what the bank's willing to do. Now I'm going after it and go make it happen. When you put something under contract, when you're, when you're negotiating with the seller, if this is, a, uh, what would you say is an appropriate uh, amount of time because I know that like with single family homes when when we sell houses to our out-of-state investors you know we we do like a typical 10-day due diligence period which allows for a simple home inspection and say maybe like a termite pest inspection and that's about it on multifamily scene obviously I know it kind of differs depending on how many units but like if you're looking at a 50 unit property what are you seeing you know, I would do no less than 30 days. I would push for 60 and you'll probably settle in on that 45, you know, day period. Um, again, some of that's going to depend on the, the, the seller. Um, and some of it's going to depend on how buttoned up you are on, on the front end, you know, cause some lenders are, are super complicated. If you're trying to use a national bank or something like that, I've seen that a lot uh, here recently with, you know, a national lender that doesn't understand Memphis. So their, their due diligence is going to take that much longer, but a local bank already knows bank uh, Memphis. They know you. Um, but you want to make sure that due diligence period to your point, Kurt, you need to, you know, put that as far out, start out as far as you can go 
and work your way back, but I would you know, never do it on a multifamily less than probably 30 days. So that gives you time to inspect, time to get an insurance quote, time to you know make sure the bank's in line, get your appraisal, uh, all that stuff. So, um, you know, and build that into your, you know, your due diligence and your time that you can, you know, you can set that contract up that you can, you can get out for any reasons you want. So just, just keep that in mind and, and work with somebody that knows how to write contracts to, to, so to set it up that way. Um, and then, you know, in analyzing deals, I just said insurance requirements, you know, look at your liability exposure, your deductible, um, decide what you're comfortable with. So when you first started out, you know, I think you want your, you know, your deductible as low as you can go and your coverage as high as you can go because you don't want to be out any money. Um, and we'll talk about some of that here in just a minute. Um, some red flags, you know, um, new leases less than four months old. I've seen apartments that are 20 units and 10 of them are less than four months old. And, you know, guess what? I mean, I, I really remember this is on uh, apartment on Merriweather. This is about five years ago. And we wonder why nobody was calling us had, you know, you go by every day, the paper that you left three days ago was still there. And, you know, it's because whoever sold it just put, you know, bodies in there with a lease, you know, agreement. And you go, you go in there, you finally get in inside and it's like a mattress and a chair. Literally there was like four or five units like that. So when you got less than four months old, just kind of dig deeper, you know, like, uh, we have a, a, a saying, a, a core behavior at our office, three levels deeper. Why, why, why? What's going on? You know, what's going on? Just kind of uh, look at it a little deeper. Uh, no professional software with rent rolls. You know, if you got some guy that's selling you an apartment that's 20 units and, you know, it's all on, you know, ex, you know, scratch paper, you know, versus some sort of professional software that they had to take the time to do, um, even if it's Excel. Um, but the scratch paper, that, that's, that's a red flag to me. We talked about pro forma. Don't, you know, those are red flags. If you're trying to sell it on pro forma, you know, be like, well, why aren't you doing it? You know, like what's causing that? What's you dig deeper, three, three levels deeper. Why is it not hitting the pro forma? So that's, you know, there's gotta be a reason why they're saying, um, selling, excuse me. And then, you know, if you got multiple sales over the last several years, 3250 Guernsey, if I want to look it up, this is one that our client bought and we don't manage this one right now, but look at, look at the math on this. Like when they bought it, I was like, Oh my gosh. I mean, I just knew, uh, it's, it's headache. You know, we'll look back in 2020, 2021, watch it'll be sold again. But basically you see somebody sold it, made a little money. Somebody crashed. Somebody made some money crashed. Somebody made, you know what I mean? Like it just this over and over. Um, so it's just this constant, um, changeover. So just be careful that look, Go to the assessor and go a little, a little deeper and see what the history is on that apartment. Cause that's really going to tell you a lot. You know, like if you see an apartment that's been owned by the same person for 20 years, you know, like my apartment that I just sold on Monroe, which I'll tell you about in a minute, you know, I've owned it, I owned it since 02 to, to 2019. So to me, that's a very clean, somebody's, you know, poured into it that it's been stable enough. They could pay their note and pay their taxes, their insurance, and probably make a little money and pay it off. So just keep that in mind. All right. So I got three examples to give you guys just, just to kind of say, here's some different flavors. Uh, so feel free again, to stop me anytime. Yeah, Dan, I'm just yeah. going to jump in real quick. Cause I just wanted yeah. to kind of let everybody know that, you know, you know, Dan's going to talk kind of in detail about, you know, three or so uh, examples and please feel free to uh, message in any questions that you have, because I will jump in and ask your question to Dan. And then when the presentation here is done at the end, we'll, you know, we'll maybe give one more call to see if anybody has any questions, but other than that, I'll kind of wrap it up at the end. So uh, just keep going, Dan. Yeah, man. So um, bought a 19 unit when I was 27 years old for $280,000. Uh, biggest blessing and mistake all at the same time. Uh, had a hundred percent financing from the bank. Uh, because they wanted to keep that loan. It was a good loan. It appraised well. Um, they had it. So I put it on a 15 year note. It was $6,200 in gross rent per month. I literally had a fire the first month. So I remember meeting the guy. I was like, man, that guy's going to be trouble. And literally the next day, get a call, four units completely destroyed. 
I was underinsured, no renter's insurance. I had no experience, no connections, no wisdom, no, no nothing. Um, so I freaked out. I mean, I was, it was, it was a hundred something thousand dollars worth of damage. And, um, you know, I, I just had to step back and figure out, figure out how to get through that. So, you know, my, all my assumptions were wrong. You know, my vacancy, my collections, when I, when I first did the math, I was like, when it, I did a pro forma um, versus what I really should have looked at his actuals, you know, I should have made in several, several thousand dollars a month. Um, and that was not the case. So anyway, I, going back, I refinanced in, uh, a year later for three, 31,000 more uh, on a 15 year note. So I literally lost a year, um, but I had to pay for that fire some way, somehow. Um, but when I got through it, I was like, man, if I can get through that, I can get through anything. You know, it really gave me the perseverance to, to really, you know, say, man, you just, I mean, <laughs> I joke, but you learn by the fire, you know, like you just learn by doing. And so, um, I did that one. I've had it, I've upgraded the units over, you know, the next 10 or 12 years, I raised the rents, you know, over a thousand bucks a month. Um, uh, I paid it off in 2016 and here's the beauty of it. This is why I love multifamily. That's, that's been good for me. Um, I created a line on it in 2016, immediately after paying it off for $168,000. So not only do, was I creating, you know, several month, thousand a month in cash flow. But then I had a line of 168 that I could go do something else, whether it be loan it to somebody, do a flip, um, invest in whatever. Um, and if you do the math, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And I can, you know, this is totally a side and I could do this offline, but you know, you can almost double your return on your investment once you pay it off by putting in a line and using your line of credit to do some pretty cool things. So, um, as I said here, it created options. Um, and then, it's so crazy on this one apartment fire in 2019. This one actually got seven units. So uh, literally about a year ago, um, upgraded the seven units, raised the rents. Um, you know, and then I'm just now getting a new line, uh, that's, uh, just got it appraised Friday. So that should come in. Sorry for the typo there. Missed that one. $300,000 versus 168. So now I have another 130,000 and, you know, firepower to go do something. Um, if I want to. So um, anyway, I just want to show you that journey. That was my very first apartment, still own it to this day. Um, and you can see, you know, I raised the rents over a thousand bucks a month and paid it off. And I have a line that I can do other investments with if I, if I so choose. Uh, 1490 Monroe. This is a cool one. Um, purchased in, it's a 16 unit right behind the old Danvers or the now I think it's cookout. Purchased it in 2002. You can see that for 445,000. This is one that's a little different. So I had an 80% bank note for 20 years. And then I had the original owner, the owner of that property at that time, financed 20% of that deal to me for five years on a 20 year amortization. So basically I went to the bank, said I got this deal for 445. The, the current owner is gonna finance, what is that, 90,000 ish excuse my, my math. And the bank was okay with that. And Kurt and I talked about this when we met, like the bank is okay with that because they're in first position and the owner was okay with it because I gave him his price. He wanted, um, gross rents were $6,300. And then here's where the math gets interesting guys. Like in three to five years, you know, when you do something like that, whether it be a house or multifamily, again, I kind of cross both, but, um, this is specifically multifamily. The math, if you do a 15 year note in three years, if you got an owner finance piece of 20% between a tiny bit of little appreciation and what you pay down on principal on both those notes, you should be able to take that second out and put it all on that note with the, the bank on it as a first note. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Midtown investment, I just had a long-term perspective. It was, it was, uh, it was in a rough little spot right there. Um, paid it off in 2016, right behind the other one. I created a line on it in 2016 for $400,000 that I could utilize for other investments. So here's the crazy thing. So sold it in December of last year for $850,000 at a 5% cap. 
crazy. You know, and I, why I say that was like, it wasn't for sale. A guy in the office said, would you sell it? I said, no. I said, well, that's stupid. Everything's for sale. And so I said, give me a, give me an offer, but I need to know, you know, what's my walkaway price. And, um, I said, you know, when they came back and finally they started out 700s and something, I just kept saying, no, I didn't even look at the contract. I just kept saying no. And when they got to this number, it became worth, this is a key lesson to me for y'all to kind of talk through. It became worth to somebody else more than it was to me. Does that make sense? Like it was an emotional one because it was my second property. I've owned it. I lived in Midtown. I loved it. Um, but at that point, he tipped me over the edge where now it's worth more to him than me. And I, I did the analysis. I could have fixed it up, spent $200,000, raised the rents, rents like he's going to, but now I'm back in debt. I researched 1031s, um, you know, and that's where I kind of landed with this. If you see on, on the bottom, 10, I did two, a 1031 exchange, which for you guys to understand, like I thought it was going to be this stack of paper like this because I had no idea. I'm, and this is just last year, guys. I've been doing this 20 years it was two pieces of paper. It was the crazy. I was like, what? I was like, what, what? seriously? And all these years I've just been afraid of 1031. It just sounded so daunting to me. Like that's what the big boys do. And, and I just didn't know, but hey, Dan, um, yeah. Can you just for, just for a real simple example, can you just explain what a cap rate is and maybe, maybe how, how you look at that and what would the definition, well, like the textbook definition and give an example. Yeah, the te textbook example, I mean, the, the, the definition is just your return on investment on if it was all cash, basically. So if you have a, um, if you get $100,000, you know, net income on that property and you spent $500,000, what is that? 20% uh, return on your investment. So that would be your, your cap rate would be 20%. So it's after your expenses, but it's your cash on cash return on. So at $850,000, he's saying he's going to make, you know, what is that? 40, 45,000 or something like that. 42,5. I don't know. Something like that. Um, which is just crazy. I think in Memphis. So I had to let it go. Um, but all that to say 1031, two apartments in Dyersburg, 34 units. So it turned $6,400 in gross rents to 16,000. And it appraised those two apartments appraised for 980. And here's the crazy thing: one of the apartments, the the owner took back a hundred thousand dollars second mortgage, a second. So now now I have a line on the 980 for 80 percent, and the owner took a hundred thousand dollars second just because I asked. And he said okay, and so um, created you know created a line of credit 773 uh, to utilize for other investments. So. Last one, 1645 Well Station, 11 units right by Jerry Snow Cone. Uh, I tried to purchase this. Uh, we tried to purchase this in mid 2000s. We purchased, I think, 2016 for 300. It was 100% owner finance note. A uh, guy in Australia on a 15 year. Uh, we've done minimal improvements. We tried the raise of rents. Here's a key lesson for me on this for you guys is like, we tried to raise rents from 500 to like 550. Units sat vacant, we kind of reanalyzed the area. Lower the rents 495 and now we've been at, you know, 85 to 90% occupied for two years. And I, you know, uh, I think this is the current list price, but it's somewhere around $425,000. And we'll, we'll utilize this proce proceeds to pay off uh, six duplexes in a house that that owner also financed to us. So we allowed him to finance all this, pay a bunch of stuff down since 2016 and hopefully sell the apartment, which has been okay not the greatest, but then we'll end up with six duplexes in a house out of uh, that whole deal. So, um, all right. In summary, key multifamily learnings, you know, I, and I said this earlier, start with your financing options, helps you dis determine the size of the apartment complex you can go after, learn the key differences and assumptions for A, B, and C. The A, B, and C is totally different. I mean, I don't know many people that play in the A apartments. It's usually private equity, you know, the big boys, we tend to be in the B, B minus, C plus kind of properties. Um, understand insurance, your deductible and your liability. Reserves are super important. I can't stress that enough. Like if you're gonna, you know, all these deals I talked about that 100% financing, 80, 20 or whatever, 
I needed to make sure I had several thousand dollars sitting on the side for the what ifs. And the bigger the unit, the more thousands you want. You know, so if you have a 10, 10 unit apartment, a couple thousand bucks, 3000 bucks, 20 unit, you're probably gonna want five, six, seven thousand dollars just sitting there because you just don't know what you're, you know, you do not, no matter how much an, 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 analytics you do, you don't know what you're getting into um, until, you, you know, until it happens. Um, you know, cause like I said, remember that first fire, I was underinsured and the insurance company wanted to give me 58% of what that fire cost. I was able to get it to about 80%, but I was still freaking out. So, um, you know, and then just realized it's a different game versus single family. That's, that's, to me, that's a big deal. Um, you know, it's, it's not, not to say it's like playing with the big boys. It's just playing on a magnitude. It's not, you know, us, you know, doing single family versus multifamily. It's just knowing different things and knowing things of magnitude. It's not any different. The basics, the, the blocking and tackling is the same. And then the other piece is just service maintenance management is a key component. Like how are you going to manage that day-to-day -day maintenance? Cause you can get killed on those hundred dollar service calls over and over again can you figure out how to have a resident manager like that first apartment I talked about, I've got a resident manager there that he can handle about 70% of the stuff, you know, leaky faucet, toilet backed up, you know, but if the sewer line out back, I got to call the plumber or I got an AC unit condenser out. It's got to be replaced. I got to call the HVAC, but the knickknack stuff he can help. And that will condense your um, uh, service piece, uh, service maintenance piece uh, tremendously. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at apartments. I got a question for you, Dan. Yeah. So, so for invest, you know, a lot of investors you'll see who are fairly new to real estate investing, maybe they don't own any property at all, or maybe they even own just a few single family homes, but do you have any recommendation to anyone who's like, I'm brand new and I want to start buying multifamily right away. Do you, do you suggest that someone start out with multifamily right away? Or do you suggest them to get some experience with single, single family properties first and then maybe look like what, when do you suggest or recommend somebody to maybe start looking at it? And I know that, I know it's kind of a, a uh, it's different for everybody, but just kind of maybe like a general rule of thumb. Man, a uh, great question. I mean, this is totally my opinion. I think that, uh, you know, if you're by yourself, a four or five, eight unit apartment is probably feasible. I don't, I, I actually had a partner on that 19 unit. So that actually helped me, you know, like, because say we, so I was 27 years old and there was a $38,000 difference on what the insurance company was going to pay versus um, what uh, uh, the cost, you know, 38,000 versus 19,000. That's, that sounds a, t a whole different ball game. If you split that in two, does that make sense? Like, um, so I think you just got to understand your reserves, your wherewithal. Um, and a banker can really help you with that. I think that's what I would encourage you to do. Like that's one thing I think we miss in this line of work. We're kind of getting silos where I would just go to your bank and say, who's successful? Who have you seen not be successful? what did the successful people do? What did the not successful deep people do? And I'm looking at this type of property. What would you recommend? Does that make sense? Like lean on others. Don't just, you know, I can give you generalities, but I would, you know, try to get some specifics with the people that are actually gonna loan you money or, or whatever. Do you have any other maybe suggestions for anybody who's watching in terms of, I mean, obviously you've put, you, you know, I appreciate you. You put together a great presentation with loads of great information examples. Are there any other, materials or websites or places where you could maybe suggest or know about that other people can go and, and maybe learn more about uh, multifamily similar to what you talked about. Man, I mean, uh, you know, bigger pockets. I mean, bigger pockets is the best one. Yeah. I mean, go to those forums about multifamily um, and see what books they recommend on multifamily. Cause there's a lot of guys and girls that uh, um, do smaller multifamily. I think, uh, I think Memphis Investors Group has a uh, multifamily or like yep. an apartment investors subgroup. And I think it's run by a gentleman named Eric Nowicki, Eric. who when I first met him, he actually moved from San Diego to Memphis because he bought like a 180 unit multifamily that he 
the, the idea was to renovate the whole thing in phases and he lives yeah. here now full time. And I think he's one of the board members or something like that at MIG. So if anybody's looking to connect with another local investor who's doing multifamily, Eric Nowicki at Memphis Investors Group. Yeah. And I mean, Kurt, I would just say out of that, you should be able to find, I, I'll probably do exactly what you just said. Just go to MIG, start with that group and just the books can tell you a lot, but like just meeting somebody that's doing it, going and seeing their property, walking it, understanding what they, you know, what they did and what they're, what they're looking at and how they're looking at, like, you know, you get out of it, what you put in it. So, you know, you can't just go and buy a multifamily. I mean, that's essentially what I did. And I had no idea. I mean, I just, I mean, looking back on it, I was, you know, ignorant. Um, but it, it caused me to learn a lot quicker, but I mean, it could have been a totally catastrophe. I'm just being totally honest with you. Sure. Sure. Um, well, like so. I said, I really appreciate you being willing to come on and do this presentation for us. I hope that everybody who's watching uh, felt that the information was valuable as well. Again, if my software, my program here does everything like I'm hoping it does when we close this out, I will be able to load this presentation up to uh, YouTube and our Facebook page. Oh, we got another question here real quick, Dan. It says, yeah. do you require your renters to get renters insurance? It's interesting. We, uh, we require either copies of renters insurance or we have a liability policy that we, we uh, put in place that actually protects the owner against uh, tenant negligence. So it actually protects the owner. Like if, if uh, they cause a fire up to about up to a hundred thousand dollars. So it's a pretty good, pretty good policy. But if they don't do that, they need to, you know, reply, uh, send in documentation that they have renter's insurance showing some liability coverage for us. Do you find the, that being an issue when uh, looking at the tenant pool, when they're, when they're applying to things like that, do you find that a lot of tenants will not go through with it? Or do you find that more are willing to? You know, that was a limited belief I had. I thought that that would be a huge issue. And we have implemented about a year and a half ago and really have not had, you know, any major issues doing that. So I don't, I think that's a limited belief. Just like I, I had a limited belief that you could not rent a house uh, without appliances, you know, back in the day. And our buddy Robert Field taught me that you don't have to have a refrigerator and stove to rent a house for 750. And I didn't believe him until I did it. And I was like, wow, I rented it for 750 and now I don't have to pay for appliances or the upkeep. So definitely some limited beliefs in there. So awesome, man. Awesome. Man. Well, listen, thanks again. Thanks for everybody checking in. Like I said, you will all be notified uh, very soon for the April meetup, whether now, and, and somebody did ask me uh, earlier if, you know, if this, if we can continue to do this type of presentation, even with the, when the coronavirus has kind of settled down and we can all go back out in public and, and meet up and gather, uh, you know, for anybody who's wondering about that, even with our live events, I will still stream them live to our Facebook page. So if you cannot come or if we're not doing a Zoom meeting like this and we're doing something live in person, whether it be at a restaurant or a, or a event center type place, I will stream it live to our Facebook at Real Estate Wealth Coaching Facebook page. So we just, because we know that a lot of people can't come to the meetings and they'd like to, uh, you know, for whatever reason, but we will stream them live. I will let you know. The plan is, is to do a, a panel of those gentlemen that I told you about before. So uh, since we don't have any other questions, again, I thank everybody for joining. I think it was pretty successful and I will do my best to make this up. Uh, hold on. We got Rebecca there. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Rebecca. We appreciate you for watching. So everybody, I will see you in the next video. Dan, we're good? Good, man. Thanks for uh, letting this introvert, introvert talk for an hour. Appreciate you. Uh, let me share what, uh, what not to do. <laughs> Man, listen, it's awesome. Thanks again, everybody. Everyone have a great rest of the night. Stay safe. Uh, we'll all be joining uh, each other here real soon. Thanks, Kurt. Take care, everybody.